Well, good morning. If you've been with us week after week as we've been working our way through the Psalms since really the middle of March, you're not going to be surprised that this morning's Psalm is also yet again another Psalm of David. This morning we're looking at Psalm number 65, so if you want to go ahead and open your Bibles and find your way there, that'd be great. As we look at the Psalm this morning, let me set the stage for you by talking about the fact that many of us, maybe all of us, pray at least occasionally. Now, of course, prayer is a sign of the Christian spiritual life. Those who pray less are in a season of dryness at best, and at worst, maybe they don't have the relationship they assume they have with God. But even atheists, according to some surveys, occasionally pray. Now, we don't know who they're praying to or what they're praying about, but the reality is everybody finds themselves occasionally in a time of need, of confusion, confuddlement. They don't know what's going on, and so they turn, perhaps even just blindly, hopefully, to somebody who does. The context of this particular psalm is prayer. We don't know what was going on other than some details in it that suggest that the scenario is X. But we don't know what year. We don't know if there's a corollary in one of the other historical books in the Bible that corresponds with this particular storyline. But it's about prayer, lifting up prayer to God, God answering prayer, and how do we respond to it when he does. And so put that in your mind and let's read the words of David. Deal with me, pardon me for a moment as I'm going to turn wildly to my left as I read on my Bible off to the side. I'm not obviously at home. I'm not working from my normal location at home, but I want to make sure I got a devotional out to you this morning in a timely fashion. So here we go. Psalm number 65. David begins, Praise is due to you, O God, in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you shall all flesh come. When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. By awesome deeds, you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. The one who by his strength established the mountains, being girded with might. Who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of the waves, the tumult of the peoples, so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe at your signs. You make going out in the morning and the evening to shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the grain, for so you have prepared it. Your water is you water its furrows abundantly, setting its ridges, softening with showers. And blessing its growth, you crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with abundance. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. And so, as you can tell, listening to that psalm, it's clear that some things we can discern from it. David is praying. It is a prayer of thanksgiving. It's a prayer rejoicing at what God has done. The scenario seems to have been that they've been praying for rain. Imagine in our culture, here at least in Charleston, we tend to take rain for granted. We get a lot of it. Plus, we have water that flows out of our sinks. It flows abundantly. It flows cleanly. We can drink our water. We can wash our clothes in it. We can cook with it. We don't think about it much. And of course, here in Charleston, anywhere you look, there are swamps nearby. You've got rivers, you've got lakes. And of course, not far from where our church sits there in the northern part of North Charleston, about 15 miles away as a crow flies, is the second largest ocean in the world. And so we're used to water. But imagine a scenario where you live that the rain comes, and when it comes, it comes wonderfully. But when it doesn't come, things dry up, the earth parches, it cracks. Imagine your entire economy is based on whether or not it rains much this year. And so here's David commenting on an answer to prayer. The people have seemingly prayed about rain, and God has sent it. And so the song is a song of prayer that is about praising God for answering. And woven throughout is this imagery of rain, of crops, of a blessed harvest at the end of the year. So let's go through it, and in your own mind, begin to think about in what ways Does this correspond with your prayer life? What things have you prayed for that God has answered abundantly above and beyond you could have ever imagined? And then ask yourself, did I respond by praising God the way David did? So let's go through this psalm, not necessarily verse by verse, but at least big idea by big idea. Verse 1 again. David begins, praise is due you, 
God's earned it. He deserved it. It's his right. Praise is due you, O God, in Zion. And to you shall vows be performed. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us we need to negotiate with God, but very often we find in the Bible examples, and certainly in many of our own lives, cases where somebody is in desperate need. They lift up their prayers, and one of the things they promise is, is to praise God. In this case, vows. Perhaps it's a sacrifice that if you do this, I'll give you this sacrifice as well. But this negotiation, not in terms of you give me this, I'll give you that, but the recognition that I believe, God, you can do this. And when you do, here's how I'm going to respond. And so even when the prayer is being lifted up, even when the request is being made, we find David referencing this idea that already gratitude is on their heart and worship is in their plans. Verse 2, O you who hear prayer, we have a prayer here in God, to you shall all flesh come. One day everybody is going to come to God in need. When iniquities prevail against me, when sin is being taken in action against David, yet notice the second part of verse 3, you atone for our transgression. David understands when bad things happen, whether it's a drought or whether it's persecution or whether it's political turmoil, ultimately while it is sin that's coming against him, he recognizes <clears throat> that ultimately it's because of his own sinfulness. And so he's begging, asking that God would atone for his sins to cover them. Verse 4, here's God's response to that need. Blessed is the one you choose. So here is God as the sovereign king of the universe. Blessed is the one you choose and you bring near to dwell in your courts. Blessed are those eternally. Happy is the word blessed sometimes. Of those who are in your presence for all eternity because of your grace, because of your mercy and kindness. Verse 4 continues, we shall be satisfied. Those who are in that category, those who've been blessed, those that God has chosen, David counts himself among them. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house. Specifically what? It's not that you go to God's house, the temple is the image here, or the tabernacle for David, but it's the image of being in the presence of God for eternity. We're going to be satisfied with it? But what specifically, the end of verse 4? With the holiness of God's temple. The uniqueness, the fact that it's set aside for the glory of God is what's going to bring us happiness, give us a sense of filling. By awesome deeds, he continues in verse 5, recognizing God answers prayers. By awesome deeds, you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation. So God answers in righteousness. What God does is always right. Sometimes with awesome deeds, sometimes with subliminal, subtle things that maybe only you pick up on. I think it's one of the great pleasures and joys and maybe one of the great purposes of prayer is that when we pray, if you keep track, if you keep a list mentally or literally, when God answers, you can look back and go, there's the sign of God's life or his, God's actions, God's mercy in my life. And so he sees these things, these deeds that God has answered in righteousness, who is the God of our salvation, verse 5 says, as well as he's the hope of all the ends of the earth and the farthest seas. God is the only hope, he says. The one, verse 6 continues, still praising God for who he is, not what he's done, but for who he is. To the one who by his strength established the mountains. Mountains are symbols of firmness, of greatness, of strength, of permanence, being girded with might. God can make the mountains. Who stills the roaring sea. Seas are often, if you remember in the Psalms, images of chaos and trouble and turmoil. God can still them. The roaring of the waves, the tumult of the peoples. The situation does not overwhelm God. And why does he do it? Verse 8 so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe of your signs. People are watching. Your prayer life might ultimately turn out to be a testimony, a witness to somebody else. You make the going out of the morning and the evening to shout for joy. So 24 hours, morning and evening, God makes them so that they shout for joy. You visit the earth, and here's our fulfillment of that prayer request again, and you water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. And so here's this blessing of we've prayed to God for rain. We've prayed to God for a great harvest, David says. And God's mercy is overflowing. That's why David says elsewhere, Psalm 23, that my cup overflows. When God pours the pitcher of water into your life, it never ends. That's why the river of life in Ezekiel in the book of Revelation that flows out from underneath the throne of God flows forever even though it flows symbolically from the top of the mountain. 
Verse 10 continues that imagery of rain and water. You water its furrows abundantly. You set its ridges. So it's coming through. It's raising up the edges because the flow is so strong. You soften it with showers. That's the land. And you bless its growth. You crown the year with bounty, your bounty, God's bounty. What we have that is good, as James says, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights above. There it is. Your wagon tracks. Now here's the harvest being brought in. They're putting on wagons and bringing it in from the fields. The wagon tracks overflow with abundance. And so the wagons are exceptionally heavy, and the furrows that they're cutting as the wheels roll through are even deeper than normal. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The pastures are blooming and blossoming. Too much food to count. The hills gird themselves with joy. Everything's green. The mountains are beautiful as life there is abundant because of the rain. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. There's so much life and green and verdant things growing in the meadows that the animals are coming automatically. The valleys deck themselves with grain. And then notice how all of creation, nature itself, responds to God's goodness and mercy. They shout and sing together for joy. We're called to pray. We're called to pour our heart before God. But we also need to remember God does these things when he answers us or even when he withholds the answer for his own glory. Let's purpose it in our hearts that we're going to praise God no matter what, knowing that somebody else might need to see that prayer answered for their benefit. Or somebody else might need to see how you respond when God doesn't answer it. But in the end of the day, it's all about pointing ourselves, our hearts, our minds, our praise to, towards heaven or to join with us to invite others along the way. I encourage you this week to be in prayer. Prayer about your situation, prayer about the world situation, prayer about health, wealth, whatever the case may be. But be in prayer ultimately that as Jesus prays in the Lord's Prayer, that God's will will be done and that he will be hallowed, that he will be set on high, both in your life and the life of all those who are watching and listening. I hope you have a great week. Keep on praying.